tell you the history of the French Revolution in, in 15 years. No. Uh, what I do is to explain what I try to do. Or if you want, in, 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 I work points in this book different from um, uh, the others on the same time. As you know, many. The first point is I try to write the narrative of the events. I explain. Usually, that kind of books, that kind of book has thematic chapters. Uh, one chapter on the, the role of the church, another on the on the financial question, another on the warfare events. I didn't do that way. I didn't write that way. I I followed a strict chronological order. Which means that in each chapter is a period of time and different topics are mixed together in the same time. For instance, I'll give you one or two examples of what I am trying to explain. For instance, if we take chapter 8, the title of the chapter is September 1792 to January 1793, and there is a small summary at the beginning of each chapter. For this one, it's the opening of the convention, namely the proclamation of Republic, the clash between Gimont and Mondal, the trial and execution of the king. Or, if I do another chapter, the tenth, the title of the chapter is June to October 1793. And the summary is the Federalist Uprisings, the Committee of Public Safety, the Assassination of Marat, the RAG and the Popular Movement, the General Maximum. Um, it's not an accumulation. There is, uh, at least uh, I hope there is, uh, a logical thread which runs through, which makes things. I think, written that way, this book is more readable than other books on the subject. Even for people who are not at all familiar with the period. The second part is I tried to allow the two great voices of the revolution to be heard. The two great voices, the greatest voice, famous greatest voice, and the popular voice, the ordinary people voice. The French Revolution was really a great movement, a great period for political enterprise. It was something completely new before uh, and the uh, ancien regime, ancient regime, you say ancient, ancient, ancient regime, the old regime, the old, old, old regime, old regime, old order, ancien regime en français. There was no public speech. The king didn't speak in public. To whom could he have? Nobody? No audience. The only eloquence at that time were religious, the great uh, sermon sermons, uh, the great uh, funeral orations by Bosway and others. That was the eloquence, but only eloquence. There was no, it was a random audience. In the country, during the revolution, the great political speeches by Robespierre, by Danton, by Saint-Just, Saint -Just, they were political events. If we take, for instance, uh, the great speech by Danton in September, 
17 magnitude when the military situation was almost desperate. The speech in which he said that famous sentence, Gorodas, 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 toujours Gorodas, et la France est sauvée, we must there, there, there again, and France is saved. That was a shock which prepared the victory of Van Dier, which is a few days later, I guess. These speeches by famous orators. Uh, we can find out there very easily. They are collected in books available in every good uh, library. It's easy. Which is not the case for the, the, the speech of ordinary people. What was said in the streets is lost. Not completely lost because there were spies who noted, reported, verbatim where they were, where they heard the street. And some of these reports uh, have been preserved, but it's small. The street was not the only place in which ordinary people like you and me could be hurt. <coughs> Sorry. There were clubs for a popular uh, audience, not so much the famous Jacobin, which was quite a high level club, but the Cordelier, the other one, the other big club, the Cordelier was really a popular assembly. Everybody could speak there, uh, even women, which was not the case in the Jacobin. And many of many uh, insurrections, many important decisions, many important events were discussed and prepared in this famous club of the company. Danton and Maha. Uh, were frequently uh, spoke frequently at the company, uh, not Robespierre, not Saint Just, uh, not Demoulin. There was a class difference between both clubs. But fortunately, uh, there, were, there was another place in which the popular voice could be heard was heard. It was the National, National Assembly itself, meaning the Convention. First, there were a lot of people in the, in the galleries, in the galleries, and they expect their people very loudly, whistling, applauding, crying. It was not a formal assist. Uh, presence. It was, they were really active during the, the, the discussions. And more important, every session, and there were one session per day, sometimes two, one by night, every session started with a reading of letters arriving from all over the country. And they answered these letters. And more important even, there were delegations coming sometimes from tiny villages which were which came at the back of the convention and they expressed themselves extremely uh, openly and sometimes they say very, very harsh things. Uh, I'll give you an example. In February 93, uh, okay. yes, on February uh, 12, 12 uh, February 93, a delegation of the 
48 sections of Paris. Paris was divided in 48 sections at that time. The delegation presented itself at the bar of the convention, and the orator of the delegation said, Citizen legislators, it is not enough to have declared, declared that we are French Republicans. The people must also be happy. There must be bread. For where there is no bread, there can be no law, no liberty, no republic any longer. We have come without fear of displeasing you, without fear of displeasing you, to cast light on your errors and show you the truth. <laughs> you have been told that ju a just law on standard provisions is impossible. That would be to say that it is impossible to govern states once tyrants are overthrown? No. A just law is not impossible. We have come to you to propose one and no doubt you will ask them to adopt it. Of course, um, the deputies, they were not happy at all to hear that kind of speech. They didn't adopt the law in question, of course. But that shows one thing. That shows that though the convention was not a democratic assembly from a sociological point of view, there were, there were only uh, two workers and probably not a single real peasant. In spite of that, the ordinary people could have their voice heard in this assembly, which is not the case since then <laughs> in no country and no period. My third and last point is about violence. The usual cliché about uh, French Revolution is it was a bloodbath. The Revolution the is the Revolutionary, the Revolutionary, the Guillotine, the Terror. Of course, there is no doubt that there were a great mass of violent death during the revolution, thousands. But the question is, when and where? One could say that the first four years from uh, uh, spring uh, 89 to uh, summer 93, the first four years were not, I should say, non-violent. There were no mass killings during these four years. If you put part in the storming of the Bastille in July 89 and the storming of the Tuileries, the end of the, like, the royalty, the monarchy, uh, in, in August 92, if you think about these two days, the violence was the responsibility of the forces opposed to the revolution. The famous massacre, 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 massacre. massacre of Champ de Mars in July 91, in which the crowd peacefully gathered to sign a petition was gained by uh, troops gathered by Lafayette and Bailly. The real mass killings started in summer 93, and they were closely related to uh, warfare events. Why so? For a reason uh, which is clear, the leading generals, the big chiefs of the army, Dumouriez, Lafayette, they betrayed. They passed to the enemy camp. 
And that phrasing created an atmosphere, a climate of paranoia, of general suspicion. And that climate, 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 brought a lot of people in front of the Tribunal Revolution. But having an idea, as one of you has an idea about the number of cases the Tribunal Revolutionnaire had to judge. Roughly 4,000, among which there were 2,000 and a half death sentences and 1,500 releases. Two thousand five hundred death sentences. It makes a lot during about one year during from from uh, summer ninety three to the end of the revolution in Yamido. Yamido is July ninety four. That makes about one year. If you divide it two thousand and five hundred by the number of day three three hundred and that makes about uh, eight death sentences a day. You see that? But the mass killings in the, during the French Revolution, there were no were no legal killings. There were uh, wild killings related to the terrible civil war which started at that time in spring. Terrible civil war in Vendée, in Lyon, in Marseille, in Toulon, mainly in the south, in south of France, but uh, it was a terrible civil war with less on those times. That makes death by dozens of thousands, which cast uh, a different light on the the main cliche of the revolution, uh, Robespierre and his followers leading people by thousands to the guillotine. The main violence during the French Revolution was the violence of civil war. Marxist orthodoxy. 
Marxist orthodoxy says that uh, it was a bourgeois revolution, which is absurd. I wonder if, um, uh, I, when I was looking at your 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 book again, there's a there's a part a, par, a portion where you, you talk about the, the the date of September 20th, 1792, as a date of great joy, um, and uh, this is the this is the the can you say something about that date and 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 why and and what your notion of happiness and the revolution is really about. It was really a moment of uh, political happiness. There are some, not so many in, in general history. Political happiness. Uh, it was September 20. The first session of the convention, which was just elected, first session, and they proclaimed the republic. But and the idea of the Republic, the idea of to, to, to get rid of the king and all that stuff, they were so enthusiastic. They didn't even vote. They stood up, they threw their hats uh, up, and the Republic was decided, was proclaimed by unanimous acclamation. There was one other example during the revolution in which a decision was taken in that way. It was the abolition of slavery. The abolition of slavery was decided by the convention in 1793, and Bonaparte uh, restored slavery uh, in the uh, But uh, the How is it possible that a republic which was proclaiming such an enthusiastic movement is now, today, in a state in which uh, the government has to uh, make loans uh, punishing the whistling of the Marseillaise uh, during the football matches? <laughs> How is it possible that such a great idea is for its own. I think uh, it, was, it was not a downward slope, uh, a continuous slope. There were two, two steps, which were the terrible insurrection of the peasant workers in 1848 and the Commune de Paris, uh, which were uh, repressed in a savage way. It was terrible. There were work, blood was flowing in the streets. It was something which, we, we, it's very difficult to imagine how this repression was terrible. And these two events, 48 and 71. Some revolutionary people had the chance, the, the opportunity to fight both, uh, on both, uh, both uh, occasions. Um, these two events uh, were the end of uh, an old dream, the dream to see the the proletariat, proletariat, the worker class, the worker class, and uh, the bourgeoisie, uh, hand in hand, working to for for for, for finishing the revolution, which was ended in uh, in 1790. That old dream was broken at that moment. And these two terrible moments, and. From that moment, what we say that Marx said the République bourgeoise was the dictator, absolute dictator on one class on the others. And this dictator 
is since then obvious under the third, fourth, fifth republic. Today, the republic is a fetish. There's something which is uh, designed to hide the reality, the reality being uh, low intensity civil war with uh, sometimes right uh, episodes of acute riots, the last being in, in Paris in uh, 2005, in the Paris in Bangu. And uh, the Republic is almost every public speech about the Republic. At the end of uh, the beginning of the end, the politicians speak about the Republic. But people, normal people like you and me in France, for us, the Republic is no more enemy, which are the meaning. All right, I think uh, I'll use this as a transitional point to talk about that, that second moment that you, and I think we should probably come back to 1848 in the discussion as well, but I wanted to um, say a few words about why I decided to go back to the commune uh, now. I wrote an earlier book that was sort of a historical poetics that was primarily about Rambo uh, and commune culture. And, I thought that the, there, were, there were two really two reasons why I, it seemed to me that the commune had begun to, uh, had sort of surged up and, 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 and was presenting itself to us in our present as a kind of, uh, it, had, it had entered the way that we figured our own present. It had become much more visible in recent times. And I think mostly it was after 2011, when you, when where everywhere from, you know, Madrid to Montreal to Istanbul to Oakland, you saw the return of a politics that was that was uh, a political strategy that was based on the the idea of, of seizing space or taking up uh, room or 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 taking. Um, places that the state had deemed to be private and republicizing them. This was the new strategy. And this, of course, to me, harkened back immediately to the chronotope of the commune and to a politics based on occupation. So I, I wanted to return to it for that reason. And then the other reason had to do again with the present, and it had to do with the, my thought that the um, that, that there really isn't any great distance between uh, the, our ever intensifying global class war um, as you know, states redistrib redistribute, um, redistribute wealth uh, to each other in the name of austerity. And uh, they, uh, there, there, there isn't a great deal of difference between now and the situation that the workers and artisans who made the commune found themselves in. If you compare the way that young people live, the, the precariousness of young people today and uh, that of 19th century workers, there is no great difference because the artisans and the workers who made the commune actually spent most of their time not working but looking for work. So it's, it's, it's very uh, um, striking that I mean, we don't really have to spell that out in detail. So I think that um, the best in a way, I don't believe that the past actually teaches us any lessons, but I do think that uh, at, the, at, at the best, we might hope that the, that the class war of the present and the climate disaster that it's unleashing will actually show the necessity of um, creating practices and or organizations that are based, as the commune itself was, on principles of cooperation, principles of association, and that that 72-day experiment in, in emancipatory organization might become uh, uh, even more visible to us today. And I think that that's why I wrote the book. The book is, in a way, my way of, of um, of uh, 
departing from our own struggles and starting out from our own struggles and then, and then possibly evoking uh, a different past and a different future than the one that actually, the one that, that the course that was taken by either capitalist modernization on, on the one hand or utilitarian state socialism on the other. And I think that there are many people that are interested in a project like that and that and the commune is actually central to that project. So um, so my effort really was to 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 go back and look at it as a laboratory of political invention and to see it as um, uh, you know emancipate ordinary lives in the midst of emancipating themselves and you, you, you'll remember that Marx um, famously said they smashed the state the communards smashed the state and he said it in English and he used that verb and that verb has always amazed me in a way um, because it, the more I read texts by communards, it seemed as though they were much more uh, involved in dismantling. I would use the word they dismantled the state. They, they sort of step by step, they took the bureaucracy of the state apart. And they did it in um, uh, by activating the political power of what you were talking about, of the, the ordinary people, or what the coming art, Arthur Arnoux called Monsieur et Madame tout le monde. Um, so, so I looked at it as a kind of everyday creation, and, and used it, the, the, the processes they used were really a, a lot of bricolage, a lot of importing, importing ideas from uh, the national past, and particularly uh, uh, from the French Revolution, an idea like the Universal Republic, which was first used uh, in the first French Revolution, but but which the communards used precisely to differentiate themselves from a notion of the republic that had a strong state as a guarantor of social order. They used the phrase Universal Republic. And this is also part of their profoundly non-national uh, imaginary. Um, they, they were very hostile to the state and they were essentially indifferent to the nation. Their, their preferred scale of imagination was at once much more reduced than the nation and far more expansive. So they, they, they really operated on those two scales. Um, so I, my own uh, sense of writing history, and, and it's interesting to me that we're both, um, we're both definitely amateurs here. We, uh, I, neither, neither of us were trained as historians, and I would like to raise that as a question for the discussion a little later. But um, my own sense of, of historical processes was, was really formed very significantly by my encounter uh, happening upon the very earliest works of Jacques Rancière and translating some of them, the, the, the Revolte Logique Collective, and that kind of post-68 attempt to both to write history and to go back to specifically the, the, the voices and the subjectivities of workers. And to, um, uh, and, and, and so following, following in their lead in a way, I developed a kind of what I would call a paratactical method of, of um, placing texts and characters and phenomena next to each other and then really listening to the dynamics of what happens when you, you do that, when you, when you essentially uh, uh, put things in relationship to each other that have not been done so before. And this is, this is really, I think, the only way that you can actually get at the subjectivity of people in the past. You have to denaturalize their setting. Otherwise, they appear merely as data. They, they, they are not subjects, they're just data. And um, so I wanted to, uh, this, this involves a very conscious staging, in other words. And, um, uh, and some of that staging is just clearing the terrain, getting rid of, of the, uh, the, the old furniture that's cluttering up things. And, 
In my case, I had to get rid of an enormous amount of uh, political analysis, um, uh, the, the discourse of the enormous literature surrounding the Paris Commune, the analyses by political scientists, by, um, by the great revolutionary men who have come since, what Trotsky said about the Commune, what Mao Zedong said about the Commune, all of, all of these voices and discourses that have, uh, um, including an enormous amount of hindsight wisdom, you know, people saying, well, why didn't they get the money out of the bank? Why didn't they, you know, lists of errors, all the errors they made. How, why did they spend their time uh, playing silly symbolic games, you know, pulling down uh, monuments? Uh, why didn't they get serious and get the money? Um, so I had to set all of that aside. And uh, a bit, in, I think, as the communists themselves did when they decided to rid themselves in their city of uh, what William Morris, who is a very, um, plays a very large role in my book, called that base piece of Napoleonic upholstery, the Vendome column. So, um, so my research definitely favored works by commune arts rather than works about commune arts. And so I, I, I really paid a very close uh, attention that uh, those of us trained in literature, I think, probably can do to not only to, to what they did, but what they thought they were doing, what they said they thought they were doing, what they, what they said about what they... Uh, what they wanted, what they desired, what they dreamed about, what the, the words that they repeated, the words that they borrowed, the words that they got rid of or abandoned. Uh, that was the sort of thing that I paid attention to. So um, my project was, I think, very um, uh, helped along the way by I, my, my sense that the commune had actually liberated itself from the two historiographies that had anchored it and had kept it uh, established what it was we can see when we say about the commune. And the first of those is official state socialism. Um, you know, the, the, the Bolsheviks definitely needed a, a precedent and the commune became the failed revolution that the Bolshevik revolution was to be the corrective of. And that's fine, but it has always seemed to me that the fierce anti-statism of the commune has nothing to do with what the Soviet state later became. So it's, it's very hard to put it in that genealogy. And it's equally hard to put it in the genealogy of the, of the fiction of the French Republic because there, there is, I mean, I mean my, my what French history, what French national history do, has to do with the commune is either completely forget it or try to assimilate it. And if you assimilate it, which is, I think, impossible to do, in order to assimilate it, you have to turn it into some sort of deluded patriotic movement or uh, some attempt on the part of workers to uh, uh, protect the young bourgeois republic against monarchist soldiers. You have to turn it into an essentially reformist movement, uh, a movement that was trying to reform the bourgeois state rather than simply destroy it. And it seems clear to me that they wanted it destroyed. So, um, so uh, I, I see the commune as belonging to an entirely other kind of historical rhythm, one, one that is much more uh, unscheduled, untimely, and disruptive. And I see the commune arts not at all as martyrs to communism, nor as martyrs to the French Republic. They, they simply are not martyrs. They are, were ordinary people trying to uh, put their social life together in the way that they, that they wanted to. So um, what, what I, uh, the, the second, the, the main, um, I think, new dimension that I bring to the book is that, uh, or to the question is that, you know, the massacre is, Flaubert talked about its gothicity 
and, and Eric has evoked the blood in the streets. And um, it is very easy to become sort of uh, fascinated by that extraordinary act uh, on the part of the state to try to eliminate one by one and on block its class enemy. It is simply an extraordinary act. But I decided not in any sense to minimize the significance of that act, but in fact to take a look at something a little bit different, which is the way in which communard thought actually um, was elaborated and prolonged after the massacre as the um, refugees and um, uh, exiles and those who had managed to escape were uh, met up with some of their key supporters like Karl Marx uh, in London or Peter Kropotkin in Switzerland or William Morris in London and they began to collaborate with them, they began to discuss things, they began to uh, elaborate an entire theory about what had transpired in Paris and their attempt, and they attempted to think it together with uh, the remnants of agrarian communism that still persisted in the countryside. So it was, a, it was, a, it was an extraordinary theoretical and political uh, uh, material that uh, emerged directly from the experience of the commune and, uh, and the, the kind of thinking through that occurred after it. And, you know, Henri Lefebvre has, has, has always maintained that the, that the thought of a political movement only happens with and after the movement. And this is what he called the dialectic of the lived and the conceived, the vécu and the conçu. The, the thought of a movement is generated by the excess of political activity. And so it, it, this is why I, I, I really spent quite a lot of time looking at these conversations that went on in the Jura Mountains uh, that, that are uh, of a fascinating actuality. I mean, we would call them ecological. We would call them the beginning of socialist ecology. And yet, it's, it's um, I mean, it's, and in fact, I was struck by, um, you know, when I wrote a, earlier about commune culture 25 years ago, I wrote about Elise Reclus, the famous commune art geographer and anarchist. And uh, at that time, he was virtually unknown except for a few French um, anti-colonialist geographers like uh, Béatrice Chiblin or uh, Yves Lacoste and a little bit of David Harvey in this country. These were the only people that were really talking about, about Reclus. Now, he and William Morris and this whole sort of set of thinkers uh, that I'm talking about are at the center of international research on uh, coming from uh, ecological theory who see in them the the, the, the beginnings of an ecological thought that died with their generation and that wasn't seen again until the 1970s. And I think this is all very interesting. It's all, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's passionant, as, as the French would say. But the problem is that these people, the ecological people, do not make any connection with the, with the Paris Commune when, in fact, it was that incredible, uh, uh, affirmation of a, of a set of political principles that, it, that generated this kind of meditation in the countryside. So, um, so, so really, uh, I'm talking about something like what the French would say, the survie of the commune, um, uh, the, the life beyond the life. Uh, and not so much, um, not so much the survivants. I mean, what is your, what is, or anyone, what is your, what is your sense of the difference between survie and survivants? Is there a difference? 
I think of Sophie Bolts as more like a reactivation, mm. right? In the way that we might say that um, the the Shanghai Commune was a reactivation, or the or even people would say that May '68 in some ways was a was a reactivation of the Paris Commune. But in my book, I'm I'm much more uh, synchronic. I'm, I'm really concerned with with what transpired during the life of the communards and the, the, the shock wave <coughs> that the event uh, unleashed throughout the continent and beyond um, and, and seeing how uh, that, um, you know, how, how, how the event created new political forms and new ways of thought and new ways of talking about those forms and theorizing in them. And just very briefly, I would say that, that, that what's at the center of it is, um, is a revitalization of the commune form. Um, in other words, uh, um, theorizing the commune, uh, as I said, both the urban insurrection with the um, older agrarian forms and theorizing them together according to the two watchwords of the Paris Commune, which were decentralization and participation. Decentralization, as in uh, questions, very questions that I think are very very pressing and, and being pondered in, in militant circles today, how to dismantle international commerce, how to, how to um, arrive at a kind of regional self-sufficiency that is not isolationist. So something like regional self-sufficiency was very, very important. Uh, and then um, participation in the sense of a a constant attention to the question of scale and to, um, to arriving at social unities that are small enough so that absolutely everyone is intimately involved in the decisions regarding everyday life. So this, this, these, these were the kinds of, of concerns that, that, uh, that, they were, that they spent their time on. Um, so I will just say that that to end end off. Uh, yeah, I think I, I'll end up with with. Um, you can see that I've extended the chronological and geographical boundaries of the commune beyond the 72 days. And the reason I did that was that it allows me to show that the Civil War was not, as is usually related, um, an outgrowth of uh, the difficult circumstances linked to the war with Prussia, I wanted to show something like the opposite, that the war with a foreign power was just one little moment in the ongoing civil war, which in your mind, I think, begins in 1848, right? That's, that's the beginning of the, the, the civil war, which we really haven't emerged from at this point. Um, but so, so what this what this expanded analogy <coughs> allows me to show is again what I would point to uh, as the non-nationalist dimension of the commune, and I'll end with just four examples uh, very quickly. The just the experience, you know, there, there's the idea of a non-nationalist imaginary, and then there's the culture that created it, a culture that would include a figure like Eugène Cotier, who we know as the author of L'Internationale, but who was a decorative artist and who, and a, a little known fact, is the enormous quantity of art workers who were communist artists. This was an enormously important um, dimension to uh, their, their um, 
Uh, and Poitier, the work culture of, of, a, of, a, of a decorative artist at that point was already internationalist. People moved around constantly. They were nomadic. They looked for work. They moved from region to region. But they also moved from country to country. So you had Spanish, Italians. Everyone was, was there. Uh, an experience like that of Elizabeth Dimitria, an 18-year-old Russian who single-handedly created the theoretical bridge between the two most important political thinkers of the era, Karl Marx and Chernyshevsky. She brought those two together by fleeing her family at that age and by uh, arriving in the commune where she actually then brought the theoretical work she had done to fruition in the founding of the Women's Union, which was the most, um, the largest and most effective organization in the continent. She did it with, with seven uh, textile workers, Parisian textile workers. Uh, someone like Kropotkin, whose own geographical transversal brings together and unites the exile community in Switzerland with the exile community in London. The, and finally, I want to end with, with an example taken from, from William Morris, who's often considered the, the, the worst little Englander in the world, but who in fact was Britain's most pronounced and, and, and avid sort of supporter of the memory of the commune. To the, to the extent that, and he, he did many, many things, but I want to talk about one small act of, of symbolic solidarity that he, uh, that he created, and that was in his novel, News from Nowhere, uh, where uh, it's a futuristic novel. I don't know if any of you have read it, but the narrator wakes up and he realizes that he's actually in London and he's actually standing in Trafalgar Square, but Trafalgar Square has been turned into an apricot orchard. And, and, and which means that the statue of Admiral Nelson has been removed, and uh, and and in exactly the same manner that the communards removed the monument to imperialism and to warfare, and to and transformed the kind of nationalistic space of the of the Bandung, uh, Square into a non-national supranational space. Morris takes it one step farther and essentially tears down the Vondo column again, symbolically, and replaces it with a, an orchard. So whereas they left it as a kind of space of potential, he fills in the space with the chronotope of the orchard as both something from the future, but also something very much that harkens back to an older, economy of, 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 of rhythm and um, uh, organic uh, uh, richness. So I'll end there. And, uh, you know, when you look at these things, I'm speaking from experience of uh, just recently, I spent at least a year practically supporting the people down in Chicago Park. Practically. And they bring up the commune all the time to me. Mm -hmm. And the imaginary of the commune. And I said, well, wait a minute. Like, let's look practically at what happened back then. The issue of armed struggle, of revolutionary war, smashing the state by organized violence. That's what was the objective in both the French Revolution and the commune. And we know what the outcome of the commune was. So, that becomes a problem, or I just wonder how you think about that. Because obviously we're dealing with people who are using direct action, nonviolence, uh, in an anarchistic fashion, very creatively. There becomes a limit to delegitimizing the state in practicality, even though I felt that they did not deal practically with the uh, police, in particular, to win them over, which I felt was always something that should be done, or maybe couldn't be done. But that becomes a problem talking about these things. That is, that they were crushed, the commune was crushed by military force and the encirclement in part by the Germans as a result of the, of the Franco-Prussian War. Now, with the French Revolution, what do we have as a product of that? 
He has an opponent. You know, he is someone who, you know, embraces the, and creates the narrative that he is the embodiment of the French Revolution after the 18th of America. And, I, and, and so I'm just trying to throw that into the mix here because, you know, too much people, when they talk about the imaginary revolutions, they forget about the practicality of doing a revolution, which is organized violence. Not uh, you know writing models or creating art, even though of course we know that that has probably a much greater impact to this day. So I just wondered what you think about that, because that, that's that's the other part of this that I think has to be talked about. Um, the question of violence, if if you think about. Uh, what happens usually in in evolution? I mean, in the beginning. What happens later is another question. But the beginning of the revolution, the violence is almost often the fact, the responsibility of those who are against evolution, the counter-revolution forces. It was obvious to the the, the violence for, institute, for, for uh, establishing the commune during the, the day, one day, March 18, uh, in 71, they gunned two generals, which were hated by the people. They went to death. That's all. And all the violence came from the Versailles army. That, that's the first uh, response. Uh, non violence, if you proclaim, if you say we are non violent, better to stay in bed looking at the television. <laughs> if you exclude violence, if you, we are non-violent, that gives too much, too big a strength, a strength, a strength to the, to the enemies. They must be a little bit scared, otherwise. And of course, uh, when we say when, when we say that the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution were successful, uh, it's obviously it's not true. At the end, there were failures, but their their first weeks, well, showed what could be done. After that, well, okay, it took a wrong direction. But even the Russian Revolution, which is the paradigm, the, the, the example of uh, something which has ended in a bloody, brutal, horrible way, the, the way the October Revolution uh, evolves, is completely different from the usual cliché. The, the idea of the communist Bolshevik party led with an iron hand by the genius uh, of Lenin, not at all, not at all. That, that what is a legend. Uh, uh, propulsé, uh, Enforced by Stalin to justify his own tyranny. But the Bolshevik party in from February to October and, and later, it was not at all uh, non democratic, homogeneous, uh, authoritarian party. They fought themselves all the time. They excluded, they gave their permission. It was a, 
it was really a completely free and democratic uh, way of leading the revolution. I think I would ask to prepare it quickly because so we can get to other um, people. But uh, I would answer that a little differently. I would say that that, that, that the idea that um, uh, of, a, of a of a failure or or you know the, that the idea that the French Revolution had been Napoleon or the the, the, the commune elicited the incredible state crime that it did. Um, that's not a failure of the communards. That's a crime on the part of the state. And for the people that actually lived the commune, a, a, a real liberty and a, and, a, and a network of solidarity were realized. So you, um, it's, it's, it's not, I think, correct to say that, that these instances then are lessons to us now, because we live in a very, very different time. I mean, this is this is this. In other words, that that what what by putting the emphasis on something that you're calling a kind of failure, uh, it, it 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 minimalizes the sort of subjectivity of the people that actually you know. Why? I mean, in their minds, it was a success. They lived it, and they they also in the process disseminated a great many ideas and, uh, and that are still with us today. Yes, um, thank you both of you. I appreciate it. Uh, looking at the grassroots that both of you dealt with. But my, and my question is about that. It's about the citizen in both of the situations. And, and I'm, I'm sort of curious. I, I, it was wonderful, Eric, how you explained the people coming and saying what their, their critique was, but then calling the legislators, citizen legislators. So I'm wondering if you could give us some, and some more insight into the concept of a citizen, how that developed. I mean, that seems like a piece of the of the French Revolution, is, is the citoyen, the seeing oneself, the identity, taking an identity and, and doing something that, that Empower, the empowerment of that, and then what happened with the commune? What's that? Is there a, a progression? Is there something we can learn from, from that? that uh, well, I think that there is a, a, a big distance. That uh, for, what does it mean to be a citizen of the universal republic? That's the question you would have to ask yourself for the commune. I mean, they. they uh, um, just that. I mean, that's 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 something that is already very distinct and and different from uh, what was going on in the French Revolution. Yeah. Um, yeah. As a historian who's not yet maybe a professional historian. Um, Forgive me this dry historiographic question, but I actually I was wondering, um, sort of building on the question Professor Ross was beginning to ask, um, whose account of the French Revolution um, do you sort of prefer? You know, obviously there's a vast literature on it to say the least, um, and what sort of gaps or absences in that historiography um, sort of led you to want to comment on? the French Revolution today in 2015 and say something new? Um, were there also contemporary events or recent events that you've had foremost in your mind as you're writing? The, the, the big gap is uh, that there were, at that time, 28 millions of people in France of which Probably 85, 90, 90 percent lived in the country, were peasants. And every history of French Revolution, including mine, uh, is mainly concerned on what happened in cities. There are, of course, serves of 
basement stories, like on the great, like on the, yeah. the great fair after after the last uh, storming of the Bastille in December. Uh, so that is well documented because one guy spent probably uh, years searching everywhere in places where <coughs> that big fear happened in order to, to document day by day, place by place, what happened. But um, that is very special uh, work, remarkable work. There are not so many. I think the big gap is that. But you don't feel like you solved that gap. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. I know. <laughs> it's very difficult because uh, it's ha it has to be local studies because what, what is in common from peasants of large uh, corn, uh, wheat uh, culture in, in northern France and poor guy with three uh, codes and two uh, uh, shell, uh, yes. code codes uh, in Auvergne. They were even today. <laughs> so a global study of Le Monde Paysan, the peasant word during the revolution, it's almost impossible to do, or in 14 uh, volumes. <laughs> Prussia. 
It arose in part because of that, but it, it also arose simply because they wanted to hang on to their guns. The working people of Paris wanted those guns. And it also, if you, if, you, if you begin with March 18, then you can do what you're doing and turn it into a, a, a motivation of national defense. But if you follow um, historians like Dalton, for example, they begin much earlier. They begin in the in the popular reunions at the end of the Second Empire. And if you begin there, if you begin with the state, you end with the state. But if you begin with the popular reunions, you get a terribly different story. You get you get for the very first time the imagination of a social commune. What it would look like, what it would like, what it would be like to have a uh, a government that was the you know the, the participation of all of the intelligences. Let's that say. may be true, but that's not what initiated the uprising. Well, how can you say that? I mean, maybe it was those uh, those. Uh, that kind of talk goes back for several decades. You go back, indeed, to what you said earlier about the Saint Coulot view about how they and their assemblies uh, embodied and carried out uh, acts of sovereignty. So, you know, that's something that uh, existed already, we may say, for at least 17 years in France, but in and of itself does not necessarily lead to an uprising, but it was indeed the decision to end the war that sparked the uprising and then came out all of these undercurrents of thought when the government yeah, to harshly repress the issues. I can say that to uh, one question by Sam. Yes. <clears throat> it's about uh, parliamentary institution. Can you say parliamentarism in English? Mm -hmm. uh, I think all which was in your book, the spirit of the community, wonderfully described. There is a contrast between that, that word, which is in your book, and uh, something which is not even mentioned in the book, the Conseil General, the General Council of La Commune, which was the assembly elected one week after their famous uh, March 18. Because the you, you know, the, those, of, those who know the common history know that the, the insurrection of the, the AD was, was prepared, led by the Comité Central, Central Committee of the Garde Nationale, which was a non elected institution. The Paris arrondissement districts, they did elect uh, deputies. To the Conseil, to the Comité Central de la Garde Nationale. Then you and you uh, and you you go. It was uh, uh, an institution of unknown people with no legitimacy. So they decided they were not. They have no legitimacy. They, they 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 didn't want to continue to run the city to administrate. The city to make the administration because the, the administration uh, was has flown to Versailles. Everything has to be done. People must eat uh, and, and, and so on. So they decided to go to uh, suffrage universal to vote. And they voted and the assembly Conseil General de la Commune, there were about 80 people, among them people, remarkable people. But this assembly took important measures, some of them are in the book. But they behaved like any assembly. They split in the majority and the minority, who spent the time fighting together, and they were unable to organize the defense of the city. 
So I think my feeling is one of the main causes of the defeat, the final defeat of the commune against Versailles is parliamentarism. <laughs> uh, I have, there is a journal official, official, official uh, report that every session of the short list of the Conseil General de la Commune in a book like that. <laughs> I, I read that book and it's a pity you, 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 you want to say then stop doing, stop, stop discussing uh, about who will replace the, the enemy is at the doors, the, the yesterday they, they took the, the, the fort of uh, stop and no no they, come, they, they go over they continue to find themselves so I think that for the next commune uh, <laughs> if somebody decides to to organize a vote we have to be very uh, skeptical as was the français Georges Le Français, when, when Gustave. Gustave Le Français, uh, in his Souvenir de la Révolutionnaire, he writes, uh, when I learned that uh, the citizens of the fourth uh, uh, district decided to vote for me, my first reaction was to say no. <laughs> but after that he accepted, and he was the first elected president of the Conseil General de la I have a question that to bring together the two books. That about the um, idea of the République sociale, a social republic, which is a major um, motto or whatever, the affirmation or, or the token um, desire of the, of the commune. And it's true that today I was very, uh, I mean, by the fact that you're absolutely right today when you say Republic in France or any French person feels like it's a, an old idea with very little uh, political power in the world, that it was very little, partly because it was in uh, hijacked, as you said, by the, by the Third Republic, by the, by the opportunist of uh, you know, the Versailles, the people who have part. So I was wondering, I mean, in, in this idea that you know that you, you don't want to place the community into this um, you know uh, uh, in, in the trajectory of Bolshevism or you know a, is there another trajectory that could be that République sociale the one that you know um, yeah. was maybe also um, the one of the of the of les journées de de août 1792 and of September 1792 you know the, 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 the creation of the republic is there something there like Different kind of, you know, notion of the republic. Well, I, I it, but it, but it, it's almost not a republic because the the social republic is the universal republic mm -hmm. again. So it, it it's it is this kind of strangely, uh, you know, non-national sort of mm -hmm. uh, imaginary, and it and it's and it's got it's got the the internationalist horizon, but also a very strong sense of, of local autonomy. So that's how I would describe it, and so that that was the desire. But what can, there's an enormous difference from the imagination of that kind of universal republic and the republic of universalism that that in fact you know uh, came in with the third republic, and um, and so you know in that sense I think that the the massacre is is the founding act of the Third Republic. It's the thing that it's the thing that um, you know. It's not the communards that saved the republic. It was the massacre that saved that particular what what the republic then became. So so yes, I would I would I would keep um, uh, not not so much not so much in a sort of utopian sense, uh, but but I think that there's there's a, there's an enormous uh, richness. To that particular imaginary that that took place in the commune, and, 
And I, I actually gave it the name communal luxury because it, I took that phrase from the artist's manifesto during the commune. And in that, uh, and that was written by Cotier. And in it, he says, we are working for um, our regeneration, communal luxury, and the universal republic. And that's the last sentence of the artist's manifesto. And it seemed as though by communal luxury, what they meant was something like public beauty, something like, you know, the, the, the you know, a meal, get, making public spaces better, making or, or letting people have the right to work and live in a space that's agreeable or, you know. And this can seem minor, but in fact, if that were the case, <laughs> you know, this is already, again, the beginning of an ecological program. It's the beginning of a, but more importantly, maybe it's the beginning of a, of a, a whole transvaluation of what a society can considers as wealth or what it considers as um, something of value. And, uh, and I think all of that is, 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 is at work. And, 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 yet, and so you have the, the, the idea of local space and beautifying it, but that does not mean a retrenchment into the municipality at all because it's communal luxury and the universal republic. Um, so so I, I think that Fortunately for us, um, some people did survive the commune, and fortunately some of them were literate, and many of those wrote, wrote books about what they thought they were doing, and uh, it's, an, it's an amazing literature. And the, the book you just mentioned, um, Souvenir d'un Révolutionnaire by Gustave Le Français, is wonderful. It's one of the best. I think that we're, we could maybe take one last short question, and then I think we're going to uh, have to wrap it up. Um, and copies of both books are for sale here as well. So one last short question. Short question. You both seem to have found or heard the voice of the people, and you liked it. And somehow participatory democracy seems to have uh, been a great lesson that's come from it. Do you see it today? Is the internet and other things that are happening somehow optimistic from your view? Is, do you hear the popular voice today? Is that a fair? Or is it in the internet? Is it possible? Is it again is it possible? Is it again possible? Well, Does it seem possible? In what's happening? In what's, what there are signs? Of? Well, certainly. Certainly. In, in songs, music, in graffiti, graffiti, Graffiti. 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 Uh, in, uh, sometimes, in Internet. Popular voice in France, I don't know here, but uh, it's sectarian. Public, public popular voice, though. Christian, do you have an answer? Oh no, I, I was thinking I was thinking in terms of uh, so you you're, you're, you mean access of, of people to public speech. I mean that's the way you you answer it. Actually, the, the, the occupations and the voice again of the voice from the people. Yes, of course. I mean, I think I think uh, I think I think that strange. Uh, vision of, 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 a, of, a, of a kind of internationalism is actually what's going on in, in, in something like Sionizane now. You could, you could make that argument. I mean, I'm not sure I'd be the person to make it, but it could be made. That even if, if, even if something like uh, the, the Troika makes it such that Greece has to drop out of the Euro, uh, the trick is that that is not at all a nationalist response. That's actually an internationalist response. Because there's nothing internationalist about the Troika or the World Bank. <laughs> I think the conversation could go on, but we'll, we'll end there and just thank both of you very much for your